Okay, so now we've got uh, Toby talking about free software in the audio kinetic library. Uh, hi. Um, yeah, my name's Toby. I'm from RMIT University. And I'm just going to talk about some of the free software stack we've been using in the audio kinetic experiments laboratory. Um, just a quick bit about myself. I'm a sound artist with a, a gallery practice, um, doing like sound installations, video art, um, that kind of thing. Also experimental musician in a few drone and noise type bands in Melbourne. Um, just graduated from uh, the School of Fine Art at RMIT, uh, majoring in sound, working in like sound design, engineering, and performance, and also um, contemporary art practice and that kind of thing. This is also my first uh, Linux conference. So um, thanks for Jonathan for having me and all the organizers. Cool. So AIC, the Audio Kinetic Experiments Lab, is where I've been doing a lot of work lately. Um, it's a collaborative research lab that um, is between the schools of media and comms and fine art. Um, and we've got a, a practice-based me methodology where we kind of dream up some weird contemporary art installation and then use that to generate research questions about perception and uh, neuroscience and that kind of stuff. Um, kind of a shoot first, ask questions later kind of thing. Um, I was going to have some examples of our work, um, but the sound's not working, so that's <laughs> um, no good. Um, just hum, yeah. I'll just play a little bit of uh, of this one. Um, it's a it's kind of a light installation. Um, so. Yeah, it's very quiet though. It's a bit delicate for that. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is basically uh, an LED lighting strip. It's powered by Arduino and, and PD. Um, yeah, so. Um, yeah, and this was my first project in AIC, and I was in charge of the lighting design, the sound, and the programming. Um, my supervisors, Darren Verhagen and Stuart McFarlane, were in charge of um, also sound and in industrial design, respectively. Um, it was part of the um, Experimental Recharge Exhibition, the Biennale of Media Art at RMIT Gallery. Um, and it's touring around Australia until um, September later, so you might get a chance to actually listen to it one day. Um, yeah, and it's PD talking to Arduino under the hood. Um, so, yeah, and the sound design for it, unfortunately you can't hear it, um, was a bunch of PD synthesis using pure data, um, some calf plugins and some really kind of cruddy bash scripts, like A playing, um, all the files and user bin um, with various sample rates and being very nasty and noisy like that, really data bendy kind of stuff. Um, so when I first started working on this project, it had been exhibited previously um, at another gallery. And it was running on this HP desktop um, that was RMIT branded um, with their kind of Windows 7 system. Had like an i7 and 16 gigs of RAM and dual graphics cards and all this stuff. But like it was so locked down, we couldn't log in without an internet connection that was approved but with like whitelisting the MAC address for the particular room we were in at the university. So it's just like, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't, we could, didn't have local file storage. We had to do everything on the network. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and we couldn't obviously install our own software without asking for permission from the university. So um, that was a suboptimal working environment. Uh, <laughs> Um, the, the patch itself was running in PD, um, and it was basically a huge text, uh, a huge array fed by these text files um, with like information of color, luminosity, and the other instructions for the Arduino to kind of do its job. Uh, and because we, it was on this network folder that we all shared, because all the researchers in the lab had to have access to the same stuff. Uh, it was really easy to overwrite your colleagues' work. Like you had to manually change the patch and the name of the file to like, yeah, do it. So it was that was also a hindrance. Um, you also had to have a sync 
a set length for the composition uh, and predetermine your, your BPM and the amount of events that you're going to have in that window um, in a way uh, for the PD understands. So it wasn't very kind of uh, user friendly. Like you basically it was so complicated we built a, a two minute button and a five minute button and the researcher can choose whether their composition is going to be two or five minutes. Um, and it was really, really hard to edit that stuff. Basically, if you had a composition of maybe 4,000 elements and you wanted to change the 300th element, you'd have to scroll through to event 300 and uh, there'd be like a slider and you'd push that up or down. Then you'd play the whole composition from the beginning, wait till you get to that element, figure out if that's what you wanted to do or not. If it was, great, save the file, keep going. If not, close PD um, and open it again from your last save. So that was, that was horrible. And we had um, RGB LEDs with 24-bit color and we were only using plain red, green, and blue, so, oh, and, and some white. So that was what it was like before I started working on it. Um, and this is kind of the theme for the talk. It's a, a riff on, on that one. People who don't appreciate <laughs> the DAWs are going to uh, make your life hard. Um, basically, if you're hand patching um, all the functionality of a, of a MIDI editor or a, a sequencer or like a, a timeline, you're, you're reinventing the wheel. And chances are, whatever your patch is going to be, it's never going to be as good as just using Ardour. So just use Ardour. Um, another part of this is People from non-Unix environments are not really used to being able to plug all their software in together um, in the way that we kind of like pipe scripts together and use small tools to make awesome things. And we've got Jack and that kind of stuff, and that's awesome. So that's the approach I kind of took to this problem. So today, um, we've replaced that massive overkill Windows box with uh, an all-winner A20 ARM chip running just um, Debian on the free repos with a USB audio interface. It just listens for, for CC data um, and hands that over to Arduino. Um, and that lets the researchers show up with their own laptop or you know, one of the workstations in the lab and they can use Pro Tools or Ableton or Max MSP, whatever they want. It's completely platform agnostic. And you get all these great things like being able to zoom in or undo or copy and paste or save and history and all the things we come to expect. Um, so that's good. Um, we can choose <laughs> how long the composition is going to be very easily, and we don't have to choose that before we start doing it. As an artist, that completely sucks. You know, like, oh, this piece was really good, but it needs an extra 15 seconds. Oh, well, I'll start again. Like, <laughs> do doesn't work. So um, that's really good. And we can just choose our own tools, work with the workflow that we're comfortable with. Um, yeah, and the researchers don't have to be programmers to understand how the system works. They just grab a MIDI cable and shove it in and work the way they normally do. Um, don't have to retrain people in your special program that you wrote that no one else has ever used, you know. Um, yeah, and we've got, we've got more colors now, which is nice. Um, <laughs> still only 12, but um, that's a lot better. Um, so in the future, what we want to do with this is get more um, people at the university composing for this. Um, we want to develop a virtual um, 3D model of this, like a lighting system um, that people can use in the same way with just a, a DAW and, and CC data and interact um, that way. Um, I've had a go in Blender um, using OSC went really bad. It was like there was like whole seconds of latency and stuff. So um, I don't know what the problem was, but um, it didn't go so great. Um, people keep saying this stuff's really easy to do in like Unity or Unreal, one of those kind of big blockbuster game engines. But um, And there's something nice about the idea of having, if we go with Unreal or something, like a, a shared C++ code base between Unreal and Arduino. But um, it's not my field, and I'm really kind of um, not keen for that, because it's not, it's not free software. And um, yeah, so if there's anyone who knows Blender and wants to have a talk about a project, I'd be really keen to hear about where I went wrong with my last shot. Anyway, um, this is another one we've done. Um, this is on 
Uh, this is called Klangberg Vegan Machine. It's part of um, uh, an exhibition called um, Geniala Dilettanten. Um, it's an ex exhibition of 1980s German subculture. Um, it's on an RMIT gallery at the moment. Um, we yeah. <laughs> um, choreographed three Anstrengende Neubauten tracks for a, a motion simulator. Um, uh, and you sit in the chair on top of this motion simulator and it, there's a projector and it shines colours straight into your face. Um, you've got to have your eyes closed for it. It's pretty, pretty awesome. We control it by touch OSC on a smartphone. Darren Verhagen, James Paul, Adam Hunt, Andrew Frost did the sound, motion and lighting. Um, Stuart McFarlane did industrial design and I did the programming. Um, if you're in Melbourne later this month, it's going to be part of White Night. Um, and then it moves up to, to Sydney to, to ambush if you're there in March. Um, yep, yeah, so again, when I started, this was uh, CCAS, the company that makes uh, the Sixtoff, has this program called SimCore, and it's the only way to communicate to the Sixtoff. Oh, sorry, I should say Sixtoff is six degrees of freedom. So there's um, XYZ, pitch, roll, and your. Um, and yeah, so there's this Windows only program that does all the communication. Um, another team had built in the Unity game engine uh, an application called Heave to um, work with that, but it had no interoperability. You couldn't undo, you couldn't zoom, you couldn't network with it, you couldn't send it MIDI packets. Um, and it was just one of these kind of painstaking line drawing operations, which was not very fun. And they, they'd reinvented the DAW basically and all the things that you like about using a DAW were not there. Um, so I did the same thing again. I put in a, a little arm board running Debian. Um, it's handling the, the MIDI. But um, there's still a Windows box in there. I wrote a, um, an external for PD in C which implements the UDP um, datagrams that CCAS uses. And that talks to a Windows box. Um, researchers can use their DAWs still. Um, PD loads up, like for, for playback, loads up finished WAV files and MIDI files and um, plays them back on command from the smartphone. Um, the processes are managed by System D, which is really nice. I'm more of a, a BSD person, um, not, but System D has been really nice to work with because all our demons kind of like relaunch when they when something goes wrong and we don't have to run things as root because it's un unprivileged and stuff so that's really nice um, yeah so issues um, there's a clock issue and we're doing weird hacks to kind of make midi's uh, pd's midi clock and pd's audio clock kind of sync together so that sucks and that's because i reinvented this DAW and <laughs> with a huge timeline reading you know things into big arrays and that sucks. Um, other big issue is that Touch OSC is a proprietary app. Um, you know it, it's fairly cross-platform but it kind of sucks if we need to distribute this to a gallery we also need to give them a smartphone with our layout. If we introduce a new track we need to make a new layout and push it to that smartphone somehow which is really difficult remotely especially if it's like an iPad or an iPhone or whatever. Um, yeah, and it just sucks that it's not, not free. So um, we've been working on something called the Audio Kinetic Jukebox. Um, and this is a web application to um, handle our tracks, our libraries, and to uh, um, also control playback and, and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it just works in the browser. Anyone can upload a, a track from kind of any device. Um, it's written in using Flask and Python and Postgres, um, running on top of Nginx, um, which is nice. It's a front end to Ardour, so it, it will launch Ardour, and then Ardour will um, send the MIDI to PD, which will send the UDP to the Windows box, which will make the motion and make the, the people at the gallery happy. Um, so I've just got it here. I'm not really sure if it's worth showing you guys, but because you can't hear anything, but we'll give it a go. So um, start a new project, call it LCA by the bay. Um, so that's a project overview. We can edit that. 
uploaded some tracks. It it's, supports 5.1 surround and one channel of MIDI. And basically what it does, you know, you grab your tracks, you upload them. It'll, um, we've got an Ardua session tarballed. It'll extract that and then kind of uh, edit the XML to, up, to uh, reflect the sample lengths of each of the tracks and that kind of thing. Um, and then when we hit play, um, Ardua launches. And we've just got all the kind of basic stuff you expect. So play, pause, play, stop, and looping. So pretty basic at this point, but yeah, it's um, really kind of handy that we've, we've got that because now we've got something that we can uh, deliver to a gallery. And if there's a problem with it, one of our compositions or we want to deliver another track, we've got a server there that we can push new tracks to. We've got, um, it works with all devices. It's um, much, much more handy. Um, and it, yeah. You don't have to be a programmer to figure out the, the layout and all that kind of thing. So, yep. Just go quickly over the experience of moving over. So disadvantages with, you know, the Linux workflow is that things like SimCore and other specialized scientific software, there's like vision tracking software and special kind of specialized scientific hardware only often works with Windows. So we've got these extra incredibly overhyped Windows boxes. Um, just kind of sitting there, not doing anything, not running our cool installations. So that's not great. Um, sound cards are hard to find, especially, you know, um, ones with lots and lots of outs, like eight or 16 channel kind of things. We've got some really nice, like, Motu hardware and Sapphire hardware, um, Focusrite stuff that we just can't use. It's just sitting there because there's no Linux drivers and, you know, I'm, I'm not a kernel dev, so. Um, and then, People are unfamiliar with it. They expect their plugins. They expect their AAA apps, and we, we haven't got those just yet. On the other hand, um, it's really cheap. We can grab these $30, $50 boards and just, you know, just with petty cash and do that rather than having to buy lots of hardware. We don't have to ask the university, like, can we please have a C compiler? Can we please, you know, have all this stuff? We, we can do it. We've got admin, that kind of thing. Um, we don't, we're not reliant on Ableton or uh, Avid or anyone to give us permission to distribute our stuff. You know, like it's all open source. We publish our code. Um, we're free to re redistribute the other projects, so that's, that's nice. Um, PD is much better on, on Linux than it is on Windows. Lots of the upstream developers are, Debian, are the Debian packages, which is nice because then it's a, it's a first class experience. Linux is really good at web servers, so that's, that's also good. Jack D is awesome. Um, yeah, we can recompile Ardour if we ever need to, you know, like, which you can't do with Pro Tools or iLock or anything. Um, and we can get around all the bureaucracy and the RMIT network with our own routers, so <laughs> that's really nice. Um, yeah, that's me. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Okay, it's afternoon tea now. Um,